Hey guys, Sandro here from Carcraft Auto Detailing in Melbourne. Today's video is a basic guide on where to start when using a dual action polisher for the first time. But beyond that, it won't be so basic in explaining what is really important to know. So rather than me just running through the basic steps, which you can find on plenty of videos out there, I want to explain why I perform each step, how I personally go about it, and what my thought process is. As for me personally, without understanding the hows, whys and whats, you're never going to truly grasp what you're actually working towards and how to address the issues and concerns that come your way. Now apart from knowing how and where to start with machine polishing, which I do hope this video will address, I think the main concern most people have is either ruining or burning through their paint. I can tell you that with dual action polishers, this is really more of a rare situation as they've made it so much easier to both correct and finish down paint much safer than a traditional rotary buffer. And as far as burning through the paint, I can also tell you that 90% of the time when it does happen, it will be on a panel crease or edge. And the other 10% is most likely when the paint has been previously repaired or aggressively sanded and compounded in the past. But in any case, although it is a possibility, it really is a rare occasion that can be hugely avoided by just inspecting the paint beforehand and being less aggressive around panel creases and edges. Now, I'm going to slightly wing it in this video, as this is a new test panel that I haven't worked on before. So I don't know what the paint is like, and I want to use that experience of going through the steps of discovering what the paint responds well to in the way of polishes, pads and technique and how I get to the point of improving the finish. You don't need a whole bunch of products to get started, but you will need a dual action polisher. And I'd recommend starting with one cutting compound, a medium compound and one finer finishing polish. And the same goes for the pads, having a selection of a foam cutting, intermediate and finishing pad. But one thing I highly recommend you have is a defect spotting light. You might not believe it when you're first starting out, but the easiest thing about paint correction is using a machine polisher. However, the hardest thing about it is identifying defects and knowing how to respond to your results. Once you get a handle on that, everything else just falls into place. But if you don't have an adequate light source that clearly shows those defects and your progress, it's like working in the dark. And you may think your work looks brilliant under basic shop or overhead lights, but once some direct sunlight hits it, you might be in for a rude awakening. So if you can get the paint looking reasonable under a true handheld defect spotting light, it'll look amazing almost under any other light source. And I do recommend, if you haven't as yet, just checking out my video on the best detailing lights and defect spotting techniques. I'll add some links in the description box on the videos I'm referring to and the tools and products I'm using in this video as well as some other machines, pads, polishes and lights I recommend when first starting out. But my advice is to not overthink it at this stage. Just grab a dual action polisher that fits your budget, try and find some decent foam pads and compounds and a good defect spotting light, a bunch of microfiber cloths and an IPA wipe down product. The rest is something you can build on and upgrade if you continue down this path. There's also a lot of detailing supply stores that sell this equipment as a bundle, so it becomes a lot more affordable. So step one is making sure you have clean bare paint. If you're unsure of how to go about this paint decontamination process and why it's important, just have a look at my how to prepare your paint for polishing video. Step two is inspecting the paint. Have a good look at it and try to identify what the actual defects or scratches are. And again, if you're new to this, check out my video on how to identify paint scratches. This inspection is important, as if the paint has only very light swirls and haze, I'm going to proceed quite differently as opposed to if the paint has deeper scratches, heavy oxidation and prominent buffer holograms.
So go and buy How This Paint Looks, which is seriously swirled up with quite a few decent moderate scratches, a one-step or medium compound such as Manzerna 2400 on a one-step pad like the Shell Concepts Blue Spider Pad is a great place to start. As it's not a very aggressive combination at all, but it's still generally capable of correcting many defects on many paints while still finishing down exceptionally well. And if the paint looked even better than this, I'd start with an even finer polish and finishing pad to address the lighter defects and see how the paint responds. But overall, this is about as aggressive as I like to start on any paint. Because in general, you should always start with the least aggressive method that has the potential to work. And although starting with a very fine polish and fine polishing pad is less aggressive, in my experience it won't have the potential to correct these particular defects. The next step is performing a test spot to work out if the combination you're starting with will give you the results you're looking for or how to proceed from there. I'm actually going to do three test spots here with three combinations of these three products from heavy to medium to light as I want to give you and display as much information as I can and talk through what you should be looking for and how to assess your results. Now in general, masking tape should be used to protect the plastics and rubbers as well as your pads from picking up unwanted residue or damaging the trims. But although the tape residue can cause issues of unwanted adhesive or glue, it's also a great tool to allow you to very clearly see and compare your test section results. So I do recommend you using it for the test section, especially if you're starting out, as reading your results can be a tricky thing that the tape line should greatly help with. So firstly, you're going to attach your pad to the polisher, making sure it's perfectly centered. As if it's not, it will make the machine run rough, limit both its cutting and finishing qualities, and it'll also put added stress to both your machine and your body with the increased vibration. Be sure to give the compounds and polishers a really good shake, as the products do like to sometimes separate, which will completely alter the way it works, sometimes limiting the cut, sometimes the finish, and most likely both. Add about 5 size P-drops to the pad to start with, as too much product will inhibit the pad's ability to effectively cut or polish the paint by clogging the pad's cells and not allowing the abrasives to effectively break down. While not enough product will result in dry buffing, giving you an uneven or perhaps slightly marred finish with reduced lubrication and inferior results. But as you progress, you can then step down to 4 or 3 size P drops as the pad becomes seasoned or primed. Work a 2 by 2 foot area or smaller. This is done because firstly it's the largest area you can generally work without overextending your reach, which will vary your pressure and consistency leading to uneven results. And secondly because the compounds and polishes have their limit. So if you try and work a larger area, you will exhaust their effectiveness before you finish a set of passes. You'll also generate a lot more heat with a longer working time to address a larger area that the clear coat just doesn't respond well to. And it will lead to dusting, a sticky wipe off and a much reduced level of correction actually slowing you down in the way of achieving good results. Next, spread the product onto your work section. You can do this by dabbing the pad and or turning on the polisher on a slow speed and quickly spreading the product evenly throughout the panel section. Most polishers today use diminishing abrasives. So if you don't firstly spread that product around, you will get an uneven cutting result. As by the time the polisher reaches the other end of the section, the abrasives will have already begun to break down. 
but if you have an even coverage to start with, it will create a uniform consistency from one end of your section to the other. In general, the best machine speed to start with is a medium speed that still allows the polisher to spin freely without stalling or bogging down. This will vary from machine to machine, but overall a speed dial of about 4.5 or so is typically best, as it should find the balance of allowing the abrasives in the compounds to work and break down at an optimal level, meaning not too quickly so they become rapidly ineffective and not too slowly so they don't completely break down before the product dries and is spent. The pressure you place on the polisher can also vary, but to start with it should really be no more than your arm's resting weight, as that should be enough to add some light pressure to get the most out of the product, but not so much as it generates too much heat and causes the compound to break down prematurely and possibly lead to damaging the finish if you really heavily press down on it. Your arm speed will also greatly determine the amount of cut and correction you achieve. But in general, a slower to medium arm movement when using a dual action polisher does work best. You need to allow the compound and pad time to work the paint. So the faster you move, the less it works. But if you go too slow, you start to generate too much heat and cut in one spot, which can again lead to damaging the paint or an uneven finish. Also, in general, you'll achieve better results with slower arm speeds for compounding the paint and faster arm speeds for polishing or finishing the paint. The main reason we work using straight vertical and horizontal overlapping lines is to ensure the correction of the paint is as even as possible with an even coverage. Once you do a set in one direction, that's known as a row pass, and in general four row passes become one set of passes. Now depending on the particular paint, compound, pad, machine, your technique and the environment, this can all alter the results you get. And although you can extend or shorten your work time to respond to those factors, 4 row passes is a great place to start that most compounds and abrasives are engineered to suit. A couple of tips I want to add are to make sure to turn the polisher on and off while it's still on the paint, or you may cover yourself and the rest of the vehicle in splattered product. Also, keep the cord over your shoulder to prevent it from hitting or damaging the paintwork. Dual action polishers are really only effective while the pad is still free spinning. So adding a stripe on the backing plate to give you an indication that it's still spinning and not just oscillating is a great way to refine your technique. As it lets you know if you're applying too much pressure and you're not positioning the pad completely flat and level with the paint. Both of which will stop the polisher from freely spinning. And in my experience, beginners do tend to hold the polisher at an angle without even realising it. So once you're done with your first set of passes, using these general techniques, use a microfiber cloth to wipe the compound residue off. 
Then give the panel a couple of sprays with an alcohol or IPA based cleaner and wipe it off once again. The reason this is done is to remove any remaining product that could make the paintwork look better than it really is by filling in scratches or masking other defects. So it really is an honesty wipe down to ensure you assess your results truly. Removing the buildup of product and paint residue off the pads is a really important step. If you have access to compressed air, it is by far the best way to clean the spent compound and pad residue off your pads. But if not, just use a small nylon brush to clean your pads after each set of passes, which will improve their performance, extend their life, and give you better, faster and cleaner results. Use your defect spotting light to compare the untouched paint to the section you've just corrected. My advice is to spend some time here and really inspect and assess what your test section has revealed. Then remove the dividing masking tape as it should even more clearly highlight what you've been able to achieve in the way of correction. As I said earlier, in my opinion, this really is the hardest part of paint correction, which is reading your results and then knowing how to respond to them and how to proceed. So the two things I'm really looking for when assessing the paint is firstly whether I have begun to remove the existing defects and to what level which relates to my combination being aggressive enough on those defects and paint type. Secondly is whether the compound and pad combination has inflicted any defects of its own, such as haze, holograms, micro marring and so on, which relates to the combination being too aggressive to at least finish well on this paint type. So let's go through these three combinations and see what the paint is telling us. So starting from the least aggressive combination of the light polish and finishing pad, I can see a slight improvement over the untouched paint where some of the lighter swirls and scratches have been slightly improved or removed. But overall, this least aggressive combination hasn't made much of a difference or impact in correcting the paint, as the vast majority of the defects are still present. But the actual finish in relation to clarity and gloss is great, which means this combination won't be able to remove the level of imperfections I want to eliminate but it could be great for finishing the paint after the defects or imperfections are gone. Next is the medium or one step compound with the intermediate foam pad. Compared to the last section, there is a slight improvement with a greater level of correction achieved. As I can see less swirling and an increased reduction of those defects. However, it still hasn't removed a great amount of the defects, which tells me it's still not an aggressive enough combination to deal with the scratches on this particular paint type. But once again, the actual finish is quite good and glossy, so it could also be a great choice to finish down afterwards. The last and most aggressive combination of the heavy cutting compound and pad has by far achieved the most correction on this paint, as I can see a clear improvement over the untouched paint that the other two combinations just couldn't match. However, it's still not to a level I'm happy with. But impressively, the finish is once again quite good, as I'm not seeing very much in the way of compounding haze or holograms. So now that I've inspected my results, I need to understand what they mean and how this will determine how I proceed. Now without a doubt, going by how hard the scratches are to remove, and just how well the paint seems to finish without haze or compounding marks, this tells me it's a relatively hard paint. As if the paint was softer, the light to moderate defects should have been removed, and there should have been some significant haze and marring, at least on the heavier cutting section. Also, what I've discovered is that beneath all the lighter swirls that are covering the paint is quite a few random deeper isolated scratches that I just couldn't see until the lighter scratches were removed. So it's pretty clear to me that I need to proceed with the heaviest combination here 
and discover how much work or sets of passes it's going to take to remove the defects or scratches to a level of correction that I'm satisfied with. So after a second set of passes, the paint defects have been further improved, but this second pass still hasn't achieved the level of scratch removal that I'm after. So at this point there are certain options. I can just keep on going to 3 or 4 sets of passes and see if that works. But the issue with that is that having to do too many sets of passes is just going to take forever and it could possibly lead to issues of overheating and overworking the paint with so many repeated sets of passes. I could also try a more aggressive combination with an even heavier cutting compound and a more aggressive pad and perhaps even use a rotary buffer. But that means that I need more products and tools and I need to start my testing again as I have no idea how the paint will respond to this new combination in both its cut and finish. And more importantly, this is already a fairly aggressive combination. So stepping up to even more abrasive products and tools means you're going to be entering a higher risk area of paint correction that will be less forgiving. And especially without a little more experience under your belt. Now that may be necessary at times if nothing else is working, but this still is perhaps a better option. When you take your average 2x2 two two foot working area and halve it, to a 1 by 1 foot area, you immediately double your correction capabilities without having to resort to more aggressive products and machines, and you can further increase your work time within that smaller area without having the issues you'd be faced with in a larger work area also resulting in a superior, more effective cut. It does however mean that it's going to increase the amount of sections you need to do, but compared to me doing pass after pass in a 2 by 2 foot area, this is actually going to be much quicker and also safer without resorting to an even more aggressive combination. So two sets of passes working a smaller area is actually producing fantastic results, which I'd say is about 90 to 95% perfect. Also, be sure to slightly overlap each section, and while working within each section, try to extend the area by slowly increasing the area as you finish. This will ensure you don't miss any spots, and that each section will blend seamlessly into the next, creating one perfect uniform finish. So this is the best combination and working technique on this particular paint with these particular defects that has given me the results that I'm more than happy with. And with that all worked out, I basically just need to follow this method to correct the rest of the paint. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not going to check my work as I go, but in my experience as long as the paint is consistent, the time you put into working out your combination will pay off in allowing you to progress much faster thereafter.
So now that this bonnet is what I consider to be about 95% defect free, I want to see if I can further refine the finish with a second stage of polishing. Now quite honestly, even without a follow up polish, the clarity and gloss is really impressive already. So in my opinion, it's really more than satisfactory at this stage, with just a single stage of correction. But I do want to show you how I'd go about refining the finish if there was some more obvious hazing or micro marring that compounding the paint had left behind. Once again, I'm going to use masking tape to give me a more clear indication of whether this follow up polishing stage will benefit the finish and to what level. So I'm going to try both the medium cut compound and pad and compare it with the finer polish and finishing pad. As far as I can see, there really isn't a lot of further refinement that is possible with a further stage of polishing. But whereas I can see a very slight improvement with the medium cut compound and pad, I can't see any difference with the finer polish and pad. This is pretty much due to the paint being so hard, that the finer polish and pad just isn't capable of making any further impact. I'm going to do a second stage with the medium cut compound and pad just to show you guys this process but I'm actually really happy with the finish right now even without this second stage. Now in general refining the paint is a much quicker process than cutting out defects especially on harder paints such as this one. In fact working larger sections with slower machine speeds and faster arm movements produces better results for the final stage of polishing. This all comes down to reducing the level of aggression as we no longer want to remove any severe defects, but just extract the maximum brilliance that this paint is capable of by being as gentle in our approach that the paint still responds well to. I'm also going to add a link to my video of the Polish Angel class leading paint correction system here, as I think it will be a great video to display the massive difference between paint correction on a very soft paint like the one in that video compared to a very hard paint like the one in this video. It really is a black and white difference and in that video you'll see how easy the defects were to remove and just how difficult the soft paint was to finish down on. So to sum up this video I just want to go over what I feel are the most important things to keep in mind about paint correction. Number one is the condition of the paint. What defects does it contain and how bad are they? Number two is the paint type. Is it a hard paint which means it will be more work to remove the defects but much easier to finish down, compared to soft paint which is easier to remove defects but can be problematic in finishing down well. Number three is are you using the least aggressive method and combination, which will largely reduce any risk of damage and preserve the most amount of paint or clear coat. Number four is are you using a good light source to inspect the paint, that allows you to assess your results easily. Number five is to take your time and do your test section. Try a few combinations and really assess them as to what's going to be the best way forward. Number six is to slowly progress. Don't go for perfection the first time you pick up a polisher. Just start with less aggressive products and machines and just look to improve the finish to begin with. And you can then work your way up to a greater and higher end of paint correction work. Number seven is, if you're still apprehensive about giving it a go, just grab a bonnet from a car wreckers. I've picked them up at times for as little as $25 each. And you can practice and refine your skills without the concern of ruining your car's paint. And last but not least is my magical tip for producing amazing results quickly, cheaply and easily. Actually, I lied because no such thing exists. So if you're looking to achieve amazing results, be prepared to put in the hours, as great work is never quick or cheap, just as quick and cheap work is just never great. The very last point I want to add is that everything I went through in this video is what I feel and regard as the basic rules associated with producing quality high-end paint correction work. And I've come to that conclusion purely based on the results I've achieved with it time and time again. 
but I don't mean to say that this is the only way to go about it, as not every job or circumstance calls or pays for time consuming high end work. Now, myself included, we all tend to deviate or bend the rules at times, but what I'm trying to say is that if you take the time to understand and learn how it's done right, you can then apply that skill and knowledge to a variety of circumstances with greater success. Or to put it another way, if you don't learn the rules first, you'll never learn how to successfully break them. I really do hope you guys find this video useful and helpful. Please like, comment and subscribe to show your support for this channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.